Great. I'm going to accidentally got caught on a hot mic. Hey, B, I heard that you've got a new book coming out. Hey, B, I hear you have a book coming out. <laughs> Is it? I'm very excited. I, I, I saw your adventures researching this book. I'm very excited to read it. It's, it's, it's called Pests? It is. It's a book about pests. It's a book about animals we hate and why we hate them. And you guys are really nice to me. And you can pre-order it now at these QR codes and get it delivered to your doorstep on December 6th. Do you have any raccoon facts for us? Raccoon facts? Raccoon facts. Mm. Or possum facts. Off the top of my head, yes. The city of Toronto spent $22 million trying to develop a raccoon-proof trash bin, and the raccoons broke through it in 24 hours. So we have really good raccoons. <laughs> really good raccoons. It's only the best raccoons. Oh Ryan, my. have you been breeding raccoons to break into trash cans? Yes, literally, good. yes. That's how evolution works. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> the best part about it is that they like made it really difficult, so it has all these like special boxes and stuff. And the raccoons were just like uh, following the rules is for suckers and just knocked them over. They yeah. just broke it. They didn't even bother. Three. Three, three, three. Yeah, you got to talk straight into them. We can't look at each other. You got to get like all slow and sultry up into the microphone. Not like that. That's. Mm-mm. Hello. Testing. Awesome. Yes. Bourbon. A little. <laughs> a little. If you can bring it in a little bit more, that'd be great. Yeah. We're getting. <laughs> yes. Okay. Put it under the mask, just like. Your mics, please. All right. Let's take turns. Emily, uncover your mic. It's this one. I'm almost right. sure it. If you have an empty seat next to you, please raise your hand so people can find a seat. This is Ryan Consul, National Public Radio. So what I've learned from B is that raccoons are the QA of the animal world instead of... (laughs) Test, test, test. Words, words, words. Things, things, things. Which one was that? (laughs) So that's not right. right. (laughs) Okay, so four. So you really got to bring it in and eat it. Oh, yeah, that one. I was on that. It's gotta be like yeah. an inch. That's so gross. Four. Can you do it? Can you just like just talk? Like say hi, hi, hi. Hi, hi, hi. Sharks, bourbon. Sharks. Sharks, bourbon. Sharks drinking bourbon. Okay. Which should be really difficult. Okay, that's that's good. Right? Okay. That's <laughs> not great. It's actually not raccoons that are the QAs of the animal world. It's the sulfur-crested cockatoo. The sulfur-crested cockatoo will like do all the mammals to shame. <laughs> Testing on number two, don't forget to pre-order Pests by Bethany Brookshire out December 6th. Excellent gift for all of your dads. Also brilliant. To sit in solemn silence on a dull, dark dock in a pestilential prison with a lifelong lock. Awaiting this, all the theater majors in the audience just immediately perked up. That's that's fun for me. Oh, what to do to die today? A minute or two till two. A terrifically terrible thing to say. We have a slightly different version, and that bothers me. Do you know the mother pheasant plucker one? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm not the the mother pheasant plucker, but the mother pheasant plucker's son. Or uh, one sock cutter, he cuts socks. Two oh, sock cutters, they cut socks. Or I slit a sheet, a sheet I slit, and on the slitted sheet I sit. Oh, I know oh that. my goodness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I used to do, teach middle school theater, so they really like the ones I where they guess. accidentally curse. Yep. I never leave. 
They're so pretty. Is that? Yeah. Woo! All right. Um, do we have empty seats? Please raise your hand if you're next to an empty seat. So we've got one, two, or one over there and one over here. We need everybody to be seated. So we got three people in the back. I only see two seats right now. Do we have a third seat? Can, I, can you get me three? Well, we got one here, and I think that one's between the two of them. So, so we got two seats. So fight, there's actually fight, five people fight. back there. So I think we overloaded the room. Uh-oh. Oh, we got three people back there, too. Holy cow, bunga. All right. Well, one of those people is social media, so they don't take a seat. They stand in the back. Okay. Cool. All right. So everybody, if you are in the room, you need to find a seat. So you're playing musical chairs now. You got five of you, and you got two seats. Who's going to win? We're sorry. We'll right. miss you. So the two of you left. Come on over here. We got one seat and two seat. That was very Canadian. And if you're very kind, you might shift over so that the seat's on the edge, those of you in that row. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got a packed room for this. This is very exciting. Thank you for coming out to the science track. You are all filthy. Um, Degenerates, a lot of you. We've got three extra minutes, but we can just start. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody else is coming. They can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Speaking of, my news item is... <laughs> so this panel is called The Year in Science. Uh, we've done this a number of years uh, now, but this one is After Dark. Hello. Which means we can bring alcohol. <laughs> And we can swear. I was not informed. Fuck yeah! Fuck yeah! Yeah, there you go. And we can talk about all sorts of fun things like sex and drugs and, I don't know, like everything else, like rock and roll. So, so why don't we get down to it? I would, love, I would like my lovely panelists to introduce themselves one by one, please. Cool. Hi, everyone. I'm Ray Pendergrass. I am a science writer and edutainment producer, primarily events for drunk adults. So hi, yes. my people. <laughs> hi, uh, my name's Ryan. I teach engineering and write children's books. <laughs> I would just like to say the title of his first children's book is called Stealing from Wizards, and it's utterly genius. Yes. Yes, you it is phenomenal. You absolutely buy it. My familiar is a rat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Bethany Brookshire. I am a science journalist, and I have a book coming out in December. Ooh. Please reorder it. Please buy 10 copies. Thank you. Wait, where can I buy my copy? <laughs> right here. The QR code. Ooh, <laughs> QR code right here. That's very convenient. I'm Rachel Burks. I am a forensic chemist and a professor and a science writer. <laughs> And I am Emily Fink. I am a science communicator. Background is forensic anthropology, and I break stuff for a living. Yes. Nice. Mostly software, sometimes <laughs> audiences. So my name is Matt. Uh, I'm the moderator for this panel. Um, so just before we actually do get into the main content, uh, please make sure you're wearing a mask <laughs> over your nose, under your mouth, and if you have to take a sip of your lovely beverages, uh, please pull it down temporarily. Take your sip or your lunch or whatever you're doing, uh, and then uh, please replace it. Uh, so thank you very much again. This does not allow orifices. We don't want any orifices on this track. No. Yeah. No, we're going to talk about a lot of them, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, please cover your ears. You don't want to hear what we have to say. <laughs> so, Ray, what do you got? Uh, oh, you want me to just launch in? Yeah, with just, the news we're going gonna to just rapid fire these. All right. So uh, this one is a little bit more technology than it is science, but uh, startups are always trying to innovate how they give perks to their employees, and a adult startup known as Strip Chat is now offering VR wink pods uh, for sorry, folks sorry, to... Sorry, sorry, sorry. I think I misheard you. No. Nope, nope. You, you sure didn't. Okay, okay. okay these these state-of-the-art <laughs> wink pods oh, look so wait, like wait, 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 which part of you is in VR? <laughs> <laughs> You know, 
That I don't know, but they look so they look like something out of Ready Player One. They're very sci-fi, and that's what you do in them. You ready your player one. And um, <laughs> there's like an Oculus headset in there and like a big TV, which I don't understand why you would be both a TV and an Oculus headset. I found Some it of really us get hard. motion sick, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Uh, and also, they said in their official press release that there's also lotion and tissues and et cetera. Okay. How often do they clean them? Ne- never Not often enough. enough. <laughs> Not enough. Just so throwing it out there. This is also beta testing. They are using their employees to get out all of the bugs and the kinks. Or not. <laughs> uh, okay. Before releasing it to the public so the technology of the future is coming. Release. As... <laughs> That was like three puns in one sentence. (laughs) Welcome to this panel. I I have a question as someone who professionally breaks reward employee rewards company programs for my day job. How do you earn points for this wank reward system? (laughs) Is is there a point to dollar value like? That's a good question. Yeah, I want I want somebody to bring this up in their negotiation for salary. Like I. I you know, I'll take 10000 lower, but I get four extra times in the wank pod. I week. really need to know what the HR white paper of this is. <laughs> we really need to know how the sample set was like constructed. I, we need to know the demographics. I also need to know what the employee retention data is. <laughs> employee satisfaction has skyrocketed, <laughs> but naps have increased proportionally. But it's all short-lived. <laughs> uh. <laughs> mm. It's a good thing we're a quarter-based society, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what do you got, Ryan? Uh, so one of the challenges in a lot of uh, sexual research, especially around sexual fantasies, is that people are uh, a little cagey about their deepest held fantasies. And some relatively recent research with the uh, best title uh, for a paper I've found in a long time has found a way to help mitigate some of the fact that people aren't fully honest when disclosing about their sexy thoughts. Uh, the paper is called Digging in My Secret Garden. <laughs> <laughs> Disinhibitory effects of the hidden observer. And basically, uh, what they have uh, discovered is that if you ask somebody directly, let me, let me get the quote of the text. Um, Please bring to mind your absolute favorite sexual fantasy once you have it in mind. Please describe it in as much detail as possible using, using whatever words seem appropriate to you. If we just ask you that... Oh, not now, okay. hey. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. I don't know, by all means. Uh, this is not... This, yeah. um, this is not the Q&A we have, yet. We have, limited no. t- we have limited time, Ray. We this do is, not an, have this time. is an extra fee workshop um, now. So if we just ask you that, we'll get a certain set. But if we alter the question very slightly, and we include the preceding paragraph. Imagine that there exists a deep part within you that you could call the hidden observer. (laughs) This part of you knows every detail of all behavior and thought processes that go on within you, and is aware of the deepest intimate information about yourself. However, it cannot be asked to talk about this intimate information unless it is allowed Uh, Emphasis mine, um, is allowed by you to do so. Now, please ask your hidden observer to bring to mind your absolute favorite sexual fantasy. Once your hidden observer has this fantasy in mind, please ask your hidden observer to describe in as much detail using whatever words seem appropriate your favorite fantasy. I'm pretty sure I bought this on the last Steam sale. (laughs) I'm going to start calling the Facebook marketing algorithm the hidden observer. (laughs) (laughs) So apparently, (laughs) if if you ask people to ask their voyeuristic sex goblin inside them... What their fantasies are, they will tell you all sorts of stuff that they would never have told you if you just asked them. That's not them, it's the goblin. (laughs) So so that was mine. B, what does your voyeuristic (laughs) sex goblin have to say about your next news item? Dolphin clitoris? Yeah! (laughs) So as you may know, okay, anybody ever seen a, a dolphin penis? Many times. Yeah, oh, I know, God. I did work at the aquarium for five years, though. And so. even if you hadn't, they do not put them away. Yeah. Anyway, so dolphin penises we knew about, dolphin vaginas, of course, we knew about. Uh, and now we now have scientific evidence for the dolphin clitoris, which is, interestingly, not located in the same place as the human clitoris. 
Um, so the dolphin clitoris, you take your dolphin vagina, which is not shaped like this, but for the purposes of my, yes, okay. Um, and it's on the anterior inside portion of the vag. So it's kind of like a G-spot, yeah, actually. Yeah, okay. Like it's sort of okay. G-spot placed. Um, and not only did they uh, acquire this knowledge from the uh, bodies of 11 dead dolphins, hey, hey sacrifices for science. Um, they naturally died. <laughs> um, they also found that other female dolphins will give another lady some help yeah. with her clitoris. Uh, and that it contains um, strong erectile tissue and is highly uh, ner uh, has a lot of nerve endings in it, so it's very sensitive. And so they hypothesize that female dolphins can orgasm. No one has actually caught them at it, but it's probably coming. Ah. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> this is what you signed up for. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, rate us in the welcome app. back mm -hmm. to Dragon Con, Ray. I know. No. Honestly, I think we need a break from sex, so <laughs> murder? Murder! Yeah. murder. Yeah. All right. Uh, do we want just murder, or do we want murder and drugs? Special murder. Murder drugs. Drugs. I feel like we need to build up to it, a little foreplay with just murder, just and murder. then we move into the murder <laughs> and drugs. The combination and murder and the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll do, maybe I'll do, well, do we want just murder, or do we want murder and drugs? Murder and drugs. Murder and drugs. Murder and drugs? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, murder and drugs. Uh, and also, extra bonus special sauce, evil twin. Oh. Okay. So, this is a case report in, in Forensic Science International, one of my, my faves. Uh, and <laughs> sorry, one of my faves. And so there was a case, and there was particularly, there were some intoxicated individuals, three people in a car, and the car goes, and I'm not making this up, off a cliff, okay? Now, here's where anyone ever watched like Passions, One Life to Live, Days of Our Lives, any of the solid, right? Right? If there's not an evil twin involved, did it actually happen, okay? <laughs> Turns out two of the three passengers are identical twins. The person who dies in the accident, however, is not one of the twins. Okay. But who was the driver? Whoa. Because when they got to the scene, they couldn't figure that out. It was quite a high impact collision. There were two living victims nobody was actually still in the car except for the deceased person. Okay. And of course, they could not give witness testimony. Right? So they need to figure this out. They do blood alcohol, they do other things, they realize that two of the three, way over the legal limit, amphetamines, alcohol, a whole smorgasbord. Which two do you think were over the limit? The dead one and one twin. Both twins. Oh. The deceased person was stone cold sober. The living twins, who, by the way, literally walked away from this accident, which considering the car is like a miracle, they say she was driving. One of them was in the passenger seat, and one of them was in the back seat. Now, based on the injuries of her, they were like, bullshit. But now <laughs> they have to prove it. Problems, right away. I'll ask the panel first. Problems with trying to prove this: who's driving, which identical twin is driving. Well, they got some DNA evidence issues. Yes, conventional DNA is not going to be able to distinguish monozygotic twins, right? They'd all been observed driving the car that day, so latent prints, which are easily distinguishable between identical twins, isn't going to help you, and it didn't. Were they wearing seat belts? Nobody was wearing a seatbelt. Okay. Both twins had injuries to the left side of their body. So that doesn't really narrow it down too Does much. Does anybody have like a wrist fracture? Does anyone no. have a stress fracture in their foot? No, there were no really? injuries from the waist down. Were, do oh. either of them have a goatee? <laughs> <laughs> this is, no. This feels like one of those like bad riddles that like my dad would do, and I think the answer is going to be like. Was there a puddle like, of water on the floor, and it was an ice bullet? <laughs> this is where, <laughs> exactly. This is where 
where good old fashioned material science comes in and some fiber analysis because the particular car was a certain year of Audi with side airbags and a driver's yeah. side airbag. So one of the classic principles of forensic science is low cards exchange principle. We deposit trace evidence, we pick it up, right? So it turns out they did all of this great work with like the airbags in both directions. What is deposited on the surface of the airbag, quite a high impact hit. What is deposited on the people? Not only that, but the particular plastic that was only used on the passenger side of the vehicle, when a person hits it at high impact, the top layer melts, fuses with fabric, and debris goes in both directions. It's actually been studied quite extensively. It turns out that only one of the twins had the right material from the right airbag and that particular plastic on their clothes and their clothes fiber on that. And the other twin, their information, their fibers were only in the d other side of the car. And the decedent, her fiber and that plastic, she was clearly in the back seat. So it turns out the two twins, which they dubbed Peter Paul, and the woman in the back was they called Mary. Of course. I don't, I don't make these up. <laughs> it was Peter who was the driver, and it was Paul who was in the passenger seat. So they never, by the way, testified against each other, and they never took a plea. Oh, they all tried wow. to blame. So you got Peter, Paul, Mary. There's got to be some virgin birth we can talk about. <laughs> there sure is. <laughs> so you're saying that if I want to murder my cheating spouse and um, blame it on my identical twin, I should probably disable the airbags first or drive an older car? Yes. Okay, cool. I'm taking exactly. notes. Yeah. <laughs> I love how you always get right to the heart of the matter. Look, look, I, I have to know these things. Innocent. <laughs> What do you got? So I have, rather than uh, dolphin clitorises, I have a lovely story of uh, dolphin bros being bros. <laughs> bromance. <laughs> ah, dolphin bromance. So it turns out that, like many of you at Dragon Con, who has a wingman here? Who has at some point met someone through a wingman? Because I definitely have. So dolphins actually form packs of platonic friendship where the male dolphins will actually help the other male dolphins to um, woo the ladies. Ooh. So they will all like swim up, be all pretty at them, and then nudge her to the, um, the preferred male. <laughs> But preferred by who? By, by the pod, the male pod. <laughs> However, the interesting thing about this is it doesn't actually help them get the ladies. <laughs> that has been my experience with wingmans, yes. So, so it turns out the dolphin bros being bros should probably be asking Wing the dolphin people. ladies where that um, newly discovered clitoris is. <laughs> I mean, they the other dolphin females absolutely know where it is. You just yeah. can't talk to her. Like, cut out the wingman. Yeah, just but help. The, the other dolphin females are roommates. Yeah, they're just roommates. <laughs> Historically, they're just very good <laughs> friends. Gal pals. Very good friends. Who go to Smith College. <laughs> All right, I have, I have horny dolphin story, too. Uh, if we just want to go for the trifecta. This could actually yeah, just be the horny dolphin, horny dolphin panel. Horny dolphin panel. Just dolphins. I, I feel like we have to have had a horny dolphin panel at some point. Okay, so... <laughs> Mine is that uh, a couple of Bolivian river dolphins were caught uh, frolicking in the river with an anaconda. Uh, and uh, the, the scientists who observed this noticed that they showed obvious signs of sexual arousal. Uh, so they were using this anaconda as some sort of a sex toy or I don't know, a voyeurism situation. Uh, the, the, the jury was out among the scientists about whether or not this was uh, just a homoerotic love fest of just two gay dolphins living their best life, <laughs> or if this was sort of, as you say, uh, dolphins trying to like show off for the ladies. I don't know what the ladies would be getting out of that. Uh, uh, I do know that the, there was a scientist who was quoting saying, I, I don't think that the snake had a very good time. <laughs> Or in other words, that anaconda don't want none. <laughs> <laughs> Consent oh. is very important. <laughs> oh, no. 
was the anaconda alive or dead? Uh, I don't think this was officially confirmed. So anacondas can hold their breath underwater. Uh, but they, they was, this was being dunked in and out pretty rapidly, and there was apparently synchronized swimming going on. <laughs> Have we considered asking their secret garden observer? <laughs> Ask the interception interior interception. observer. Yeah. What was yeah. it, the silent the observer? Does, yeah. Does a dolphin have a garden troll? <laughs> yes, I've seen them do things to each other. The blowholes that cannot be unseen. It's... Ugh. Well, and it should be noted that dolphins will masturbate with all sorts of Anything. stuff. Male dead dolphins, fish. Ooh. Dead fish. Uh, pieces of coral, large rocks. That sounds Half sharp. of dead fish. Boats. Carl Sagan. Boats, yeah. What? No, actually, literally. Um, Carl Sagan told a very well-known story about being in a in a tank with a, a male dolphin who was very, very interested in learning about the cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> Relatable. Well, what do we, we have, I know we have something about boy bands in here. Oh, I have, I have so, I have also more masturbation stories. Do we want Let's masturbation or boy bands? Oh, boy. Uh, both, I, I mean. Uh, I got, I got one mastur- leads I to got, the other. I got some masturbation for you if you'd like. Oh, yes, please, please give us some masturbation, Ryan. <laughs> Will do. I write children's books. Um, <laughs> and interpretive dances. So one of the uh, wonderful and terrible things about the proliferation of technology and smart technology is we can put sensors in everything. So there's some very cool high-tech new uh, vibrators out. Um, uh, And there's one in particular, the Lioness Smart Vibe. I'm not plugging, it's just the paper references it. that can measure pelvic floor contractions, which are uh, sort of the best measure of uh, the female orgasm occurring. And they have collected data from consenting customers who have signed up to share their collected data from their vibe, uh, anonymized for research purposes. And uh, people with vaginas engaging in self-pleasure with these toys, they've learned to fall into three categories of orgasm uh, that they describe as wave, volcano, and avalanche. So, Why does that sound like Old Spice smells? <laughs> Coming soon, Yeti. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to release the new Axe uh, body spray versions of those in, in the near future. Oh, I dear. actually own one of the... I don't own a whatever that one is. I own a Perry Fit where you can play video games with your pelvic floor. <laughs> Gamify everything. It didn't tell me if I was yeah. uh, what house I'm in. Um, yeah, no, it'll give like like it'll give you like the the app that comes with it will give you a chart of your your pelvic floor responses, oh, and it'll highlight the the orgasm period. And basically, the waves you get sort of a steady contract release, contract release, contract release, and the avalanche it starts high and it goes rumbles down to a to a sort of steady slope off at the bottom, and the volcano goes. Bah! <laughs> um, Science. And one of the interesting things is that uh, women have the same response, varying lengths and intensities, but the same pattern. Uh, that is oh, an avalanche <laughs> that you're hearing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I see you've got one right here. And I'm uploading some data right now, and we're moving on to B. Rip. <laughs> I'm all out of masturbation stories. <laughs> Apparently, we all do. Yeah. Let's just no. go through it. This is a What's case study it? now. No, I don't. I, I, no, I, I don't have. I don't have any more vaginas, but I do have anuses. <laughs> right. Um, we all do. <laughs> actually, some of us don't. Ooh. So, um, this is. Uh, there was this cool thing that they discovered. It's a tiny little thingy. It's smaller than this. It's microscopic. It's from the Cambrian, so it's a fossil. So it's dead, but whatever. Um, it's called Saccharitis cororaris. Not to be confused with coronavirus. It is not. Um, and it kind of looks like a really angry, spiky minion. Okay. So, like, think big mouth, kind of blob shape, spikes. 
Um, and they thought that it was an early uh, deuterostome. And if you're wondering what a deuterostome is, you are one. Um, so deuterostomes are animals that form the butt first, anus first, and then the mouth during embryonic development. So y'all are all butt first. Yeah. Everybody. Okay. Um, and so they thought that this like little minion thing was a very early deuterostome, and they were super excited about it. Well, there was a new study that found out, no, it's actually a proteostome, which forms the mouth first and then the anus, except this thing just forgot the anus. <laughs> And it's literally it only an, a mouth. It's a tiny, spiky mouth, and and that's all. Where does it go? Uh, it just barfs everything back. <laughs> like, you know, better out than in, is what we're saying. Yeah, it's got no anus. All right. <laughs> the farts must be awful, though. Can you imagine? Are they farts? They're burps. burps. They've got to be burps at that point. Yeah, but like if it's both directions, like it's, not, it's, it's a toxic. Furp. It's a furp. Oh. furp. A furp. Ooh. We're just one step away from a long furpy. <laughs> I, I I don't have any masturbation. Oh please anus. please rescue us with, with some, some gentle murder. murder. Uh, but but I okay. do. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Do we want murder stuff or do we want like fraud stuff? Do we need a break? Do we want like fraud or do we want murder? murder. <laughs> <laughs> I love you people. Okay. You're like don't hit us with your bullshit frauds. We want murder. Okay. So clandestine graves, huge problem. You will attest to this. Yes. Right? So, but most people are actually like super lazy when it comes to digging a grave, right? Nobody's going down six feet. Right? I mean, have you ever yeah. tried? It's really, really it's hard. It's very oh. difficult. Like I only got down like 18 inches. It's like, like a CrossFit very workout. Difficult. It's too much, right? <laughs> so you think you're going to go down six feet. You're not. You're maybe going to go down two. And that's if you're really putting your back into it. So it turns out when you go down about two feet, okay, so we go down about two feet. And the challenge is, of course, is when someone like myself or you tries to then find where the grave is. Now, what are some good markers for graves if, say, several months or years have gone by? Um, you're going to look at ground subsidence. So when the ground falls down um, because the body is decomposing, you're going to look at new plant New plant um, communities, basically you're going to look at disturbed plants. So disturbed plant communities look very, very different, particularly in Ohio. Like most, well, no, that, that wasn't actually a joke. Yeah. Most, um, <laughs> most clandestine burials in Ohio, you can, once you know what you're looking for, you know which plants are the first encroaching on a disturbed area. So which, the, very, which is the best state to murder someone there? <laughs> um, you want one Legend that already has a very well-established um, invasive species. So kudzu is going to be really good. Florida is like <laughs> in thank, Ohio, thank you. you're going to get a lot yeah. of poison ivy over um, clandestine graves. Slow just response because. time and really shit investigators. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Florida. Florida. Hey, I, I didn't say it. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> so vegetation, absolutely, yeah. right? And so it turns out that's kind of like anecdotally known in some ways, but there was actually some really interesting research that was done to bury limbs and see, okay, what are the actual measurable chemical differences, morphological differences between these plots, right? And if you're thinking, how did they get approval to bury limbs? It was pigs, which is the good model species that yeah. we use quite a bit. And they did this work with begonias. Uh, huh. Hardy plant, perennial, but in some climates it's an annual. Yeah. Right? So you can track also, really good to track is that you can have lots of different actions in the leaves and the stems and things like that. Absolutely big differences between the control plots with no limbs that were deposited and the ones that were. The size of the leaves, the, the density of the plant growth. I mean, it, it looked like someone had treated one area and not treated the other, right? So kind of what you expect, but this is like one of the first really scientific rigorous explanations. And also they did chemical analysis and they, they, their study indicates it's not what most people would think, which is, oh, it's nitrogen, like in fertilizer. That's not actually what is causing a measurable difference because they did just add in nitrogen sources in a variety of forms and they didn't see near the difference. 
What they did see, though, is that there is a difference in copper yeah. uptake into the plants. Mm. So there's some kind of metallic contribution there, which makes a lot of sense when you go into which plants you're talking about. Is that but from blood? Are the plants into our blood? Well. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is Little Shop of Horrors. I would moment. watch out for those begonias next time you walk by. Oh, no. <laughs> and the other reason they picked begonias is because they wanted to model your casual backyard murder. <laughs> Oh, good, yeah. because I am not a casual backyard murderer. I'm a professional. Right. I mean, honestly, <laughs> begonias? Yes. That is not a casual. That is a dedicated backyard murderer. <laughs> you live in Canada. That's a little bit different. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, if you want to go with somebody, I mean, people do tend to bury close to home. Yeah. And so they wanted to pick some type of a plant. What would actually be one that would have in a decorative, quote, decorative garden? Uh, and so they went in that depth. And a big contributor, too, of course, is how deep did you bury it, depending on how far down the roots go. And so for those plants, and they also went with an average of, and they've collected this data, which I love, is what is the average depth people bury bodies to? Yeah. It's about 40 centimeters. Yeah. Ooh. That's 40 that's, centimeters. Well, that's pretty deep, then. That's over three feet. Yeah. That's the average. They really put their back into it. Yeah. That's an effort. <laughs> sorry, sorry. What did you just say out loud in this room? That's over three feet. <laughs> you did that just to hurt my soul. <laughs> 40 centimeters is slightly over a foot. <laughs> but we're, we're imperial here. Weren't you at the panel earlier? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Villain. just try to skip the backyard. Well, number one, don't murder anyone. All my plants keep dying. It sounds like I should be murdering. Yeah, it sounds like... Has anyone ever tried, like... Has anyone ever tried, like, anyone ever tried, like those, like, eight-foot by four-foot raised beds? You know, that seems really, like, a good size. You, you actually get staining, then. Yeah. Oh. You get a lot yeah. of staining in that. Um, yeah. It's... It's actually a thing that people try all the time and get caught in. The yeah. bigger problem, too, with burying Pro quite tip. shallow is you better hope that predators don't show yeah. up. They are the ones that will fuck it up for you. Yeah. <laughs> Those damn raccoons or yeah. some kind of thing is going to dig in your backyard <laughs> and pull a limb out, and then there you are. They're yeah, carrying the... it to your neighbor's back door, and Fido's like, look, I brought you a present. And you're like, is that Bob? And then you're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it uh, actually tends to be rats that pull bits of bone out. Um, raccoons, Danielle's got a great story about Yeah, that. <laughs> so raccoons like more low effort. Like if you just leave the corpse there, the raccoon's gonna be like, ooh, food. But um, rats tend to just like disarticulate skeletons, pull skeleton ap mm. skeletons apart because they like to chew into the bone to get that nice pulpy center that has a lot of nutrition. So they will be pulling the smaller bones out. And you're like, why are there phalanges in this pile that my cat just killed a rat oh and if you live in nebraska don't prairie underestimate dog. owls just or prairie saying. dogs <laughs> yeah i know this from experience anyway um what have you, you got like, <laughs> <laughs> enough murder back to masturbation I honestly got so distracted by thinking about what the taphonomy of a raised bed that I forgot about the masturbation when I was talking about. <laughs> and now I have to recall it because my entire brain is like, oh, what would that do if I planted that under my tomatoes? Okay, so um, masturbation. Yay! <laughs> How many of you want to make your brain stronger? <laughs> How many people want to develop their brain? So recently, and this is a study that was only recently last year done in women. It was done in 2005 in men because, of course. Of course. Um, in 2005, they had men probably, I believe, I wasn't able to find the study, um, but they had men who I believe were um, college, college white dudes who needed a little extra money. They paid them to masturbate. All we've all been there. All cis? What? I'm assuming all cis. Almost, almost certainly. Okay. But they also didn't care. Like, this is not in any way related to what the stimulus was. So oh. they got to choose mm, their own stimulus. porn. It was, it's, they were looking at what area of the brain lights up. 
um, because your brain lights up with everything you do. You know when they're saying, oh no, phones are changing your brain? Literally everything you do is changing your brain. Whether so, you had breakfast or not changes yeah. your brain. Whether you um, drink a imperial We're seltzer changing your changes your brain. We're changing your brain right now. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. No, we're not. <laughs> so they, they did this study on men, and they had them masturbate with sensors attached to their brain, and I believe in an MRI. Um, and they found out that the area that lit up in men was very, very specific next to the area that lit up with sensation in your pelvis. And they thought, oh, well, that's all people, clearly. You know, we studied, we studied men. It's fine. Done. So uh, this year, they did the same study on women, and they found out that the amount of activity in the area, the amount it lit up, the amount of work your brain was doing, correlated precisely with the amount of satisfaction in sex you reported having and how much, um, how much experience you had. So don't just do a Sudoku to get your brain active. You want to, you know partake in a little bit more activity. But interestingly, for people who were assigned female at birth, um, again, they didn't ask about gender identity, they didn't ask about sexuality. So people who were assigned female at birth had a much more plastic location of where that lit up. So they had a much, their, theirs were not as consistently right next to the pelvis. It was different spots and different people in the study. Um, Did they track whether they were right or left-handed? They did not, but now I want to look did that up. Did they track this, whether or not they were exhibitionists or not? Because I feel like this is a new level well, of this exhibitionists is almost that I'm all fascinated like, by. You've got, you've got a population of 20 people who signed up to... Yeah. Oh, oh actually, I have a description <laughs> of Bias. the, the um, sensor they used, if I can find it. Oh, while you're digging, I have an interesting corollary to this that I didn't think applied to this panel. But uh, speaking with a neurologist who specializes in strokes, they strongly encourage uh, brushing your teeth with the opposite hand because uh, switching hands lowers your incidence of stroke. Uh, it's a very like dominant uh, passive hand. And they recommend switching toothbrush hands, but I'm thinking in this case it yeah. might, Generally we might be able to span that to other. <laughs> okay. Okay, Switch so this... Hitting. So this device, how many of you have played with like Arduino boards and... I mean, not like that, but yeah. Like, <laughs> Ray, I know you. Okay, that maybe Ray. like that. Um, but, so you know. picture a circuit python, one of those little tiny um, round things with the little LEDs around the edge. This looks like you stuck a circuit python to the study participant's underwear, but it blows little jets of air at the level of the clitoris. <laughs> Where can I buy one? Which is not a, um, would not have been the expected sensation I would have expected to use, but they did get a lot of response from these women. <laughs> Sorry, I just was very amused when I saw the picture. I'm like, oh, Next time I go oh, down, I think I've I'm used those. <laughs> Sexy. That is the sex noise everybody wants. <laughs> Finally, my time as a French horn player has come. <laughs> we need a more of a trombone, or you think the the? Sorry, this is probably a path we don't want to go down. What's your next? I more masturbation stories. <laughs> oh, are we are we worn out on masturbation? Do we need like a little refractory period? <laughs> All right, let's do a refractory period. Um, uh, let's do. Uh, we got we got have some drugs in here. Uh, well, I don't I don't have all oh. of mine were sex. You know right. this. Yeah, 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 Only brought yeah. sex stories to oh. this panel. We got you. Hit, hit us up. Uh, um, Luxury psychedelics. Yeah. Okay, so murder hornets. Who remembers okay. the murder hornets? Yes, yes. We're all nervous about the murder hornets. So uh, scientists have developed a pheromone that makes them horny. Um, oh, great. That's drugs. Why, why scientists? Have you seen any <laughs> any movie where a scientist messes up and an apocalypse happens? Because like this one. Uh, yeah, but they're using it to attract uh, the murder hornets to, uh, I guess, traps. So they are, they are honeypotting the murder hornets. <laughs> uh, speaking of honeypotting, I'm just gonna go ahead and segue into my other one because I'm selfish like that. I'm a greedy lover. Um, yeah, so uh, they also, new, new science things have come out. 
how many of you are familiar with like pitcher plants, right? They're like the plants that look kind of like a toilet, like they got like a lid and like some goop in them, like a toilet. Um, it turns out that pitcher plants are potentially also uh, honey potting the, their pollinators. Um, so like pitcher plants are known for being carnivorous. They like eat the things that fall inside of them. Uh, but it, scientists are now suspecting because it was only males that were inside of them, and they're like, oh, a bunch of, bunch of males making bad choices. This is a horny thing. <laughs> this is definitely a horny thing. Uh, and, it, and there are plants that do this, that produce like uh, pheromones or like look like a sexy insect butt or whatever. Uh, <laughs> orchids are known for being covered in both pollen and insect sperm, which I didn't know that insects could Kake a flower, but be kake a flower, but <laughs> I do know that now. Uh, so if you're looking for a plant to give your lover on Valentine's Day, might I recommend orchids? <laughs> Did you know, actually, scientists are uh, using other kind of, I, I guess it's almost honey potting, um, to try and track down Burmese pythons in the Everglades? Do tell. So uh, the project uh, is usually is a take on what's called the Judas technique. So basically, the whole idea is this started with uh, goats, and you would take your like goat and you would put a tracker on the goat, and the goat had to go find its friends, and then you would follow the goat, and there's his friends, and waha, there's all your goats. It works great. So they tried to do this for Burmese pythons in the Everglades with the problem that snakes just hate other snakes. Like they don't, (laughs) yeah, except for one time of year and that is the mating season. Relatable. So you take your snake, uh, usually it's a male, but sometimes it's a female and you put trackers in it and you release your horny snake out to look for love. And the best part about this is that it really doesn't just mean that if you track your snake to where it is having its best experience, you will find two snakes. No, you will sometimes find up to seven because snakes mate in groups. So you're, if you get really lucky, you find a wonderful snake orgy. And I, I had this wonderful idea that like there would be a bunch of scientists going in and like picking up a bunch of very distracted snakes with a backhoe. <laughs> and sadly, it is not that because the snakes are apparently very smart and they run for it the instant they know the scientists are coming. <laughs> They're not not exhibitionists. No. <laughs> snakes not equal exhibitionists. But this is Noted. this is an effort. If you've heard of the uh, no Great relatable. Python Challenge that takes place, it just wrapped up in Florida. Um, this is actually an effort to try and be a bit more efficient um, about tracking down snakes. <laughs> it's true. We just need to add more dolphins. That's what needs to happen. They're great at finding them, snakes. <laughs> On the, uh, the, I believe that is called the swallow the spider to capture the fly method if you're adding the dolphins. <laughs> um, all right, you good? No, I, I'm not. But you all right. Um, uh, well, I got, I got a palate cleanser. I got something about breakfast cereal. <laughs> Yay! Hooray. Special K? No, that's not what that is. That's not Sorry, that. Sorry, okay. no? That's oh, not that. oh, it's also we known just, as. Um, I'm in for breakfast. Uh, <laughs> ketamine. Oh, I don't know if you replace one. <laughs> so, yeah, so ketamine, uh, frequently referred to as horse tranquilizer, but anything I'll tran- that'll tranquilize a horse will tranquilize damn near anything else. I was going to say, in, in the lab, we definitely used it to tranquilize lots of stuff, not oh, just yeah. horses. Do not limit the horses. Um, so, yeah, real good at tranquilizing all sorts of things, but at lower doses, has a variety of exciting effects which humans have been using voluntarily for quite some time. Um, Psychedelic trips, all sorts of dissociative adventures in brain space. Uh, But people are doing a bunch of cool research into it uh, in two main areas. The first thing is ketamine appears to work as a very fast-acting antidepressant. Mm -hmm. Most antidepressants take weeks before you start to see an effect. Uh, A single dose of ketamine some uh, mild, very short-term side effects. Uh, mild, they're not mild, there's a lot of tripping. Uh, but <laughs> like within hours uh, can counteract a bunch of depressive effects. The other thing that ketamine appears to be useful for uh, is treating certain addictions, uh, especially alcohol after uh, detoxifying from alcohol. Some therapy with ketamine can really rapidly reduce uh, people's uh, going back to alcohol um, and make them able to stay away from it much better. Research is ongoing. These are not in any way conclusive, and I do not recommend going and 
taking some ketamine if you're feeling a bit down. Uh, but, but it is FDA approved. Yeah, it is it, FDA approved. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. There, are, there are actually a couple of studies going on in Atlanta right now, yes. I believe. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. pretty easy to get on a ketamine yeah. study. I, I've been applying. Um. Yeah, they're, they're, they're taking off all over the place. It's <laughs> you guys know so much about me under this panel. <laughs> But no, it's great for treatment-resistant depression as well. Um, that's one of the things that it's really noted for, is that if you've tried all of the other things and your brain is still like, nope, ketamine, maybe. Yeah, and one of the great things, often depression and addiction, shockingly, go together. Oh, yeah. uh, so uh, there's some optimism that there might be a uh, dual treatment in one exciting breakfast cereal. I have been uh speaking of facebook targeted ads uh they tend to target these like weird uh ketamine luxury subscription boxes to me now <laughs> you all are learning so much about me in this panel um but yeah there's one called mind bloom where you pay like i don't know a, an absurd amount of money per month uh but they'll like send you ketamine and then they i guess they have like curated uh meditation playlists and things for you and it's like a, a luxury subscription box version of doing ketamine treatment. It's artisanal. Uh, yes. Yes. The, the, the effect of ketamine treatments are done with trained medical professionals and psychologists yeah. combined. You can it's Skype not a, it's highly recommended <laughs> that, you, that you only try this like in yeah. the presence of a trained professional to help you like navigate the, the They're on the Zoom call yeah. we with you and <laughs> your hole It's fine. <laughs> Got any more filth for us? Uh, okay, so let's see. Your choices are I can rant at you about a failed antidepressant or we can talk about butts. butts. <laughs> okay. We're not talking about your butt. We're talking about face mites and whether or not face mites have butts. So, do you know about face mites? Butts on my face. Not so, nearly <laughs> enough yet. You don't know nearly enough about face mites. First of all, how many of you think you have face mites? Me. Problem. Oh, the answer is all of you. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. All of you. It is all of you. I do not care how many times you exfoliate. I do not care how many steps your Korean skincare is. You have face mites. <laughs> and they probably do not care about your skincare regimen. Um, so there are two species of face mite. Uh, one of them lives in the bottom of your little tiny hair follicles, and the other lives in the sebaceous glands on either side of the hair follicles. Um, and for a long time, a bunch of dermatologists were spreading the word that these face mites did not poop. And they did not poop because they did not have an anus, okay? Much like our little evil minion. Mm -hmm. They did not have an anus. And so they would just sit there in your pores, eating your skin grease, because that's what they do. And they would not poop. And then when they died, they would just up and explode inside your pore <laughs> and cause you to have a breakout. This sounds very reasonable, right? Totally reasonable. It is absolutely untrue. Because... A study that came out this year did a deep electron scanning microscope study of the face mite and found its anus. It was right there the whole time. It's just sitting there. But it's on our face. And then I asked the scientist about this anus. Um, it was actually about the genome. The whole study was actually about the face mite genome. But I was like, tell me about this anus. Um, and she said, oh, yeah, we've actually known that since the 1970s. The dermatologist just didn't like it, so they just ignored it. <laughs> So the answer is the face mites are not exploding on your face. They are pooping, pooping. on your okay. face Got all it. the time. Okay. Uh, and the best part is they are especially doing this at night because face mites sense your melatonin. They can sense the melatonin that you put off at night in which po at which time they emerge from their little follicles and they come out on the surface of your skin and there they fuck a lot. <laughs> well, that's going to be helpful when I take sleep medicine. Exactly. Oh, yeah. I'm like thinking about the number of melatonin, the unhealthy number of melatonin pills I take per night. And when, you I'm just get up in the morning, when you get up in the morning, just look at your face real close and no. think of the exhausted face mites. They're all just like, oh. <laughs> I've <laughs> seen the Hilden mirrors. I'm not looking at my face in the morning. <laughs> I'm going to get them a wank pod. Um, yeah. <laughs> get them into a masturbation study. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's do some helpful things. Usually I tell people how to commit crimes. I can't help you with things pooping on our faces. Um, but the bacteria eat it up. In I it. am so relieved <laughs> that those don't go together. <laughs> but one helpful thing, as especially as a forensic chemist, is that some people don't know that CBD and THC, just naturally, uh, CBD will turn into THC. Right, there's, there's quite a, now this takes time, it depends on humidity and temperature and all these different factors, but it should actually, it cyclizes, there's a loss of water, the structures are actually very similar. 
and one will convert into the other. This is known. Uh, now, why is this important? Well, because depending on where you are in the country and where you are in the world, one of these can be legal and one cannot. It might be legal at certain concentrations. It might be illegal at others. And if you have a concentration change with time, you could think you have something legal only to, by the time it's tested, be in the shit. Yeah. Okay. And I don't mean the shit that these things are crawling onto our faces. So it probably <laughs> comes out in that Me too. Metaphorical shit this Medica time. I'm assuming people shit. would do this on purpose. Like this sounds like Prohibition era, put some oh, oh, oh. grape juice under the sink and then it's uh, not really wine, but close enough. I would like the milk, please. Yeah, I mean, people, some people do do it on purpose, but the, the really important thing is the study that came out that really pointed out a key problem, which is this happens naturally when you store it long term, right? And, and people who do use these products, you have to store them like all plants in a particular way, right? And, and take care of these plant products because you dosage wise, for a lot of reasons, you want to operate at the dose that you think you should be. Right? So the concentration you want to be within the range you expect. Okay, so that's just for usage and that, that would be any drug. From a forensic standpoint, the, the really kind of one that I think everybody should be aware of is that if the analysis is done by gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, which is a classic tool, you're gonna get it up to quite a high temperature. This change can happen on column. That is a problem, right? Because you could have a perfectly legal CBD product that has below the threshold of THC or what you thought was none. And on column, this chemistry happens. And in some countries, including Japan, if you have any THC, your product is now in the illegal and you are in the shit, right? So. You've got to be aware of that. Like legally, I think advocacy and counsel should be aware of that. And a scientist in forensic laboratories, this came out in the journal of forensic science, need to be aware of that so they can come up with a different protocol, right? And the easiest way around that is to actually lower the temperature. It's quite a, a easy fix, but you've got to be aware of that, right? And one of the things of course is this, I think this research is really important, is especially in, quote, the war on drugs. We know the communities it impacts the most. We know which samples are probably gonna get processed, which work isn't. And advocacy-wise, people need to be aware that this is an actual thing, right? That we can say, okay, but how was the work done? When was the last time the instrument was checked, right? You have the right to advocate for yourself, right? And also advocate for other people. Right? This, in my opinion, this is not what we should be spending our time and resources on. Right? Yep. Do I really have to follow that with <laughs> seahorse <laughs> anal fin? Yeah, lower the lower the lower the, uh, lower lower the, the tone. Okay. In this room. Well. <laughs> So who wants to learn about anal fins? Yay! Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> so, so we all know that seahorse males are the ones who give birth, right? Mm -hmm. So seahorse males give birth. Now we know how females in almost all species give birth. There's smooth muscle, you give them, it, it gets a dose of oxytocin. The muscles contract, it expels the baby with lots of pain in between and some medical intervention. However, seahorses don't have uteruses, like the, the male seahorses do not have a uterus. So instead, they actually have smooth muscle fiber that lines a pouch, and they have, um, they've taken their anal fin, which, which normally would allow them to propel and allow them to stay stable in the water. Instead, they've reappropriated it to control the smooth muscle tissue in the pouch that the babies sit in. So male, male seahorses, because that came from a fin, they actually have conscious control over it. So they can yeet their babies <laughs> out into the ocean. I'm just like, I am done with this shit. <laughs> Boom. This is the 
the best life ever. goals. That makes me <laughs> so happy. I don't yeah. know why. I was it not made, expecting giggled baby heating about on it this for panel. quite a long time when I read that. I'm like, oh, they get to just go poof. Like a dandelion. Well, yeah, and if you've seen videos of them yeah. like, expelling out the baby seeds, well, it really does look like they're just going. Boom, boom, boom. And the cool thing is, we ready, didn't ready. know that this is probably under conscious control until last year. Like, this is a brand new, and it's still a theory. Like, it's still a hypothesis, not a theory. It is. It is the, we think they're doing this, but we need more study needed. And I really hope we learn that because I want to know how they eat their babies. I can't, I can't help but envision some celebratory thing like, you get a baby and yeah. you get a baby bees, and we all bees, get babies. Bees. It's like the t-shirt cannon of babies. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I think, I went, and this is the reason why I like being your friend because I learn these things. <laughs> Besides the fact, forensic anthropology, so we always have lots to yeah. key about. But so I was don't distracted mess with by us. your nails. Oh, what about them? Glitter, because we forensic scientists, we love nothing more than a good database. We have one for everything. We have CODIS, we have ACE, we have, which is combined now into the NGI. Next and generation sometimes we make system. new ones because the old one wasn't good enough, but yep. then we keep the old one. We have one for paint, we have one yeah. for glass, we have one for fiber. We have one for glitter. Yes. Because that oh. bitch will get everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> glitter is the herpes of the craft world. You talk about transfer. Speaking. You can't get rid of it, and it is going to be on everything. And also, glitter is one of these materials, the fabrication of it, the color, the cut, the microscopic differentiations. It can actually be classified quite a bit. And if you've ever put glitter on or gotten it on you, and cursed your own existence. Yeah. Okay. It is a great forensic trace tool, and we absolutely have a glitter database. Don't know if you know that, but there you go. Which, which actually makes some of the glitter companies real annoyed because yes. glitter formulations are so proprietary that you would think they were sharing nuclear secrets. Like, they get mad. You have to get special permission. You get NDAs. To get the glitter, access to the glitter database. It's actually less than CODIS. Yeah. Less than APHIS, so fingerprint. But on par, the next group of people who's also very proprietary is all your automobile paint. Yeah. And the primers and all of that. Same level. You've got to prove that you need act. You can't just like call them up and be like, hey, wet and wild, can I have access to your glitter database? And like, be like, fuck that and fuck you. <laughs> and me with the background, but without a, a post that I would be using that in, would not, like, if I just had a research project, I would not get access to that. You basically have to be involved in the judicial legal yeah. <laughs> community to get that. So Companies. no glitter heists, y'all. Yeah, no glitter heists. If I want to know the glitter secrets, I must murder, is yeah. what, uh, is that what you're saying? But yet these companies yes, seem like, I if, don't care how many people have been killed, yeah. like, you're not getting my glitter secrets. <laughs> also, if you murder someone who made glitter, their glitter is going to be all over your lungs. Ooh. It's going to be in all over. Air, it's everything. going to be in your ears. Yeah. It's going to be in your belly button, I mean, and they are going to swab the heck out of that. Which is to so. say, if you're going to murder someone involving glitter, plan ahead and start using that brand of glitter yeah. ASAP. <laughs> yeah. Allegedly, yeah. for fiction purposes only. So, so I need to find that. out who makes the Fenty <laughs> glitter so that I can, you know, know who I can murder. <laughs> We are not lawyers. We're not giving you actual advice. Please, please, please don't murder Do and then be like, it's advice from fault. a Dragon Con panel. Okay? Particularly <laughs> not an after 10 p.m. Dragon Con panel. <laughs> so speaking of, uh, I think, Ryan, you called it the herpes of uh, the craft world, I think, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> You have a story about, about herpes? herpes, don't you? I, I do have a story about herpes. The herpes world. Yeah, yeah, herpes the her of the herpes, herpes world. The herpes. Um, so herpes <laughs> is uh, old. It's been with us for a while. There's a few variants. But uh, recently we have, we believe we've found the origin of herpes simplex version one. Uh, the oral herpes, the things that cause cold sores around our mouths. Herpes is a wonderful virus. If you get it, you probably have it forever. It'll just live do dormant in your cells. Also, most of you have it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if you, think let's just you don't live, have it, you're wrong. Yeah. It'll live dormant in your cells for most of your life, and then when stress, it'll come out in lovely, exciting places, depending on your variant. Um, but they dug some herpes DNA uh, out of uh, the teeth of a 5,000-year-old... Did you say teeth? 
I said teeth, 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 teeth. For those that missed an earlier panel, this makes sense. Uh, but they were doing some analysis on the teeth of a 5,000-year-old European corpse and found some herpes simplex 1 or an earlier variant of it and then with a bunch of very difficult math and biology uh, could trace the uh, line because you can estimate how many mutations per generation of uh, viruses. And so they have figured out that herpes, oral herpes, came from Europe uh, in about 5,000 years ago. Uh, which is exciting. One of the other exciting things is they can use that to track the proliferation of making out Ooh. as a human practice because it turns out herpes mostly was transferred uh, mother to child until people started making out, which was invented, invented, can you, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> French kissing invented in the Indian subcontinent about 3,500 years ago, but you can track that cultural change by the rapid explosion of herpes uh, <laughs> traveling around in, in dead bodies now. I figured that was just evidence for how old the Dragon Con like, smoking deck is for you know, just hand, handling around handles of liquor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's my herpes story. Nice. <laughs> You're welcome. So, I mean, do we have anything else that anybody is, uh, hasn't, hasn't hit on there for oh, their topics? Got, oh, We've got about four got, minutes I have, left. Uh, we got I have, plenty. I, I got filth for days. But. I have spider necromancy. Yes, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not only is it spider necromancy, it's spider necromancy that you possibly can do at home. Ooh. Okay. Yes. So I just Are you giving us permission? Yes, encouragement. Yes. I would never give permission. <laughs> I would just say that, like, you know, you, you do you. I would never give permission. But anyway, if you were to try and necromance a spider, I love the introduction to this paper. I mean, scientific papers are not riveting reading, but this one's really funny. Because basically they're like, yeah, the natural world has inspired many amazing robots. Like octopus-inspired robots, and slug-inspired robots, and snake-inspired robots. And then they were like, why not just say fuck the robot and just use the animal instead? <laughs> So they killed a spider. <laughs> Waste not, want not. <laughs> yes. So the thing about spiders is that spider legs work via hydraulics, okay? So it's pressure gradients inside the legs. You increase the pressure, and they go whoop, and you decrease the pressure, and they go whoop, which is why when a spider dies, it goes whoop, right? Oh. So what you can do is you can take a syringe tip, like a, a needle, okay? Insert it in the prosoma patello uh, formal Ooh. joint of your spider. <laughs> and if I and if you don't know where that is, I honestly this don't know like how to. This sounds like a lot of work. Don't know why you're even here. I don't know why you're even here. Anyway, so you so you take your spider. Basically, you insert it in the spider's like shoulder blades. Basically, if a spider had shoulder blades, which they don't, but if they did, it's about there. Glue it down. Create a nice airtight seal, and then just attach a syringe. And then when you insert the pressure, it goes. Whoop, and you decrease the pressure, it goes whoop. <laughs> oh, do and you? the spider can actually lift 130% of its body weight while dead. Uh, do, you have, do you have diagrams in your book for us? There's videos. No, it's, but there's videos like online, a, and it is deeply unsettling. It looks like a claw game. <laughs> it's like a dead spider claw game. It is all kinds of, it's, yes. It's delightful. Wait, Great. is that all we're reanimating? Are we reanimating any, any, anything else cool? I mean, I've got reanimated pigs. Uh, tell me more. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, the famous one was in, 25, in 2019. Did any of y'all read about the reanimated pig brain? Sure did. Yeah, yeah, pig brains. Okay, so basically it's a highly proprietary mix that they call Brainex because of course they do. Um, and it's they glitter. infused it into a pig's brain that had been dead for like an hour. And they managed to get electrical activity in the pig's brain. The pig had been dead, most definitely dead. And they got electrical activity in the pig's brain. Is this life? No, it's not. First of all, the pig was deeply sedated, <laughs> okay? Because they were like, we are not messing with the ethical implications of this. And secondly, the, ele the electrical activity was really uncoordinated. It was just like random little firings of the neurons. Anyway, so then they went, well, why stop at the brain? And they invented a new mix called Organ X, because of course it is. Killed a bunch of whole pigs, <laughs> okay? Let them die for an hour. Then they hooked oh. half of them up to an EMCO machine and gave half of them this Organex stuff. The ones that got the Organex started writhing and their hearts started showing cardiac activity. No. <laughs> now, we'll stop there because cardiac activity is not a heartbeat, okay? It was just like kind of, 
You ever seen ventricular fibrillation, a heart attack? So like go a to a Dragon Con dance floor. <laughs> that dancing to actual dancing is that heartbeat. <laughs> yes, it's so yes, the heart was deeply uncoordinated, but they also got full blood circulation. They got activity in the liver. They got activity in the kidneys. And of course, this makes us all go, what is death, though? <laughs> but yes, so that's a thing. Th these names of these compounds, this is act one of a bad sci-fi movie. They know what they're doing at this. You don't name something Brain X and Organ X without knowing that you're worse. the baddie. They could have been well, calling yeah. it Vivify. Oh. You know, like, <laughs> you could have gone there. <laughs> So, so we're actually at 11 o'clock, no. and so we, I, I think we can still push because there's nothing that we have to refresh for. But what I am going to say before you all start leaving is that um, the science track gets extra resources and uh, larger spaces and more people uh, based on mostly on your feedback on the app. Say you so love please us. get on the app and please. review our panels for us because that is the number one way that we can vouch for the need and the demand for more science also, track. Also, we get validation and we need it. Yes, it, we get it makes us some feel good. <laughs> when the numbers come in around now, November. So, um, you know, we used to... Well ketamine. Originally, we used to only have that section where that divider is over. And then we moved to this one. And now we're at this full. And because now we can it's tell you. so many more about, of you about dolphin sex. Yes. Yay. So please do that. And murder. And yes. murder. Yes. And murder <laughs> so, thank you very much for coming out. We can just keep going, though. We can just keep going. Yeah. Monkey dildos. There we go. Monkey dildos. We're still going. All right. We'll let, we'll let those who uh, have <laughs> other <laughs> obligations yeah, filter out. And we'll give you a... Uh, <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, stop. Oh, stop. Yes, and don't forget the book. Oh, yeah. QR Do not code forget to pre order Pest. Also, come to Sulfur X Saturday, uh, 10 yes. p.m. I More. host it. Yes, Let's, we have three weird. big panels More tomorrow. Film. Saturday at 10 p.m. It's 10 p.m., yeah. Yes, Saturday at 10. 10 p.m. we have Saul for X in the Hilton Grand East. We it's have a variety show. Earlier in the day we have uh, the Paleontology Hour in the Hilton Crystal Ballroom at one, and we have Machine Learning and Science in the Hilton Grand East at 2:30. Most importantly, Saul for X. And Saul for X. So. Are we still paneling? Yeah, so we can still. still uh -huh. All right. Well, we always. I think we're, if we're going to congregate up here, we're going to still panel. Yeah, so hang around if you want to talk to them afterwards, but uh, we're going to keep going through some stories. Panel, yeah, just a couple more. more. panel. <laughs> so that is not All right. Monkey dildo. All right. We got monkey, what, monkey what? If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. <laughs> if you're not, there's ketamine. Yay! <laughs> Right, so ketamine actually, ket I heard that, that for ketamine, there's one treatment will last you potentially like six to 12 months. Is that accurate? Uh, no, there's, you have to do several sessions, uh, and they're pricey as fuck. Um, I, I, well, that was pre, that was early in the FDA approvals. I priced it out, and it was like, without insurance, I was going to have to pay like $1,500 a session, and then have to do like eight sessions in order to not be sad. And I was like, but I, I'm largely sad because I don't have money. This is yeah, yeah, counterintuitive. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. One problem solves the other. Uh, but it's not a it's not a daily maintenance or a weekly. No, maintenance. it's not a daily right. maintenance thing. And uh, you you do the sessions and then you are set for a little while and you might have to do maintenance sessions after that. Right. Yeah. From what I understand, unless you know more. All right. So um, it was your news item. Yeah. So most of the studies uh, I've seen are more uh, interventional. That rather than it being a maintenance drug, it's an intervention drug. Like we need. You're having a major depressive episode. Let's hit you with some ketamine right now, get you stable, and then potentially onto something that will maintain uh, a status. Because the ketamine, there are addiction concerns, and also uh, the the dosing is not a subtle experience, from my reading. Right. So one, two, three, eyes on me. I'm not a teacher, but I'm married to one, so that was like, I can't believe how effective that is. I've only heard about that. No, it's, it's, it, it works very well, even on drunk adults, especially on drunk adults, as someone who makes their bread and butter. That's amazing, yeah. Elementary school teacher, very applicable to Dragon Con 10 p.m. panels. Uh, that's great. So, 
If you're still here, it's because you want to go through a few more stories with us. Monkey dildos! For science. That's actually a, it's not a dildo. I don't, from what I understand, they're not inserting it. They're rubbing on it. Um, Anyway, so long-tailed macaws, uh, monkeys. We all know monkeys, right? They use tools and they masturbate a lot. Those are the two things monkeys are most known for is tools and masturbating. And smoking. Uh, well, I don't know if they combine that, but they do combine the tools in masturbating now. Uh, I, they have been observed using rocks for sexual stimulation. Um, and and the, the studies there. show that the, the monkeys who use a rock, uh, the, the monkeys with penises that use rocks, the, the, the erections last way longer and are way harder. They are like the Viagra of the monkey world. Um, and, then, and then the... the the monkeys with vaginas also use the rocks, and they are apparently way fucking pickier about the rocks that they use. Um, and the study it said that females prefer a rough edge or angular, sharp, sharp angles. Which um, I have, you know, I'm not gonna yuck some yum. Uh, we were, we're different pathways on the evolutionary timeline so you know maybe differing press preferences but so <laughs> speaking of masturbation actually no one has ever actually observed a female dolphin masturbating it is hypothesized that they do it but no one knows how because i mean like flippers right so like how i do have you... definitely seen the female dolphins of the georgia aquarium rub up against some rocks in ways that did not seem platonic but like considering the clitoris is on the inside anterior wall of the vagina i don't know how they're getting it up in there you can get like a little penetration going with them rock right running, you know it's, it's... i just I, I i look forward to scientists finding the first dolphin dildo because i really do think it exists yeah Yes, I'll, I'll send a note to my researcher friends at Georgia Aquarium saying that we are all very concerned about the uh, sexual enrichment of the female dolphins <laughs> and would like to and, uh, donate and invest in their sexual health. Um. So the, the elementary school teacher that I was talking about who helped me learn the one, two, three eyes on me thing just arrived. Yay. So hands applaud for the elementary school teacher who comes to Dragon Con on Fridays because they're so dedicated was, and loving of their students. Was very concerned how elementary school teacher related to the dolphin dildos. I yes. Yeah. Make sure you come to, uh, uh, what is it called? It's called Educators versus Scientists. Yeah. That's on Sunday we will, at. We will fight each other. Not really. We're going to see who explains stuff better. That's another oh, one of our big. I can't flip pages, so I can't tell you right now. All right, let me vamp, let me vamp with some uh, friends with benefits. 7 p.m. on Sunday. It's on uh, my badge. Yeah. Yes, 7 p.m. Sunday, Crystal Ballroom. Cool. We're going to see oh, who explains cool. it better. Yeah. Oh, it's big. I know that now. We do. Yeah, we, did we, we all do. No, we're, <laughs> we're, we're going to kumbaya it up. It's, it's, it'll be uh, real cute. So it'll be excellent. All right, who wants to know some stuff about friends with benefits? Yeah. All right. So, in a stuff. long tradition of scientists who don't get to do any of these things, attempting to put numbers on stuff they have heard about, uh, some people did a bunch of studies on friends with benefits. This was done in Canada, uh, which, first thing I found out, apparently we have a uh, more vibrant friends with benefits community due to, uh, broadly speaking, hypothesized lower religiosity. So come to Canada, it's more fun in college. Also, healthcare helps. (laughs) Could be. Um, uh, So, uh, first thing that uh, they learned is 50 to 60% of young people in Canada have engaged in a friends with benefits relationship. Yes, I know many of us here are not in that 50%. <clears throat> Moving on. Yes, that's true. I'm not Canadian. <laughs> uh, uh, and in the uh, shocking news, why did you study this? 40% report that they did not have a fulfilling experience <laughs> and are not keen to do it again. Uh, major reasons for uh, finding it was split down gender lines. They did report that uh, they had insufficient uh, people who did not identify strongly as explicitly male or female, um, and which is scientists' way of saying uh, non-binaries are complicated mathematically. Please don't make us for- do it. That's true. But <laughs> on that di- binary split... Also uh, why we don't do math. It's great. Yeah, turns out yeah. Uh, 
wishfulness, that is the desire for uh, the relationship to turn into something more emotionally committed, uh, was a major reason for failure for women and uh, for men. Uh, they thought it was fine. They actually were basically just in it for the sex and found that satisfying. Uh, there was also a deeply unshocking difference in the satisfaction received from the sexual encounters. Uh, not very much. It was a survey study. They didn't have to. They didn't need lab space. I could have told you this for a beer. I do it for less than a beer. Yeah. No. This is. This <laughs> is. Tell you how ineffective sexual partners are. <laughs> Yeah, no, this was uh, a, a study I would find the file the results under deeply unsurprising. <laughs> this was actually, so I hate to bring it back to dolphins, but I'm kind of obsessed. So like, this was one of the things that got me about that dolphin paper about dolphin vaginas is that they said, oh yes, you know, so females will often, you know, engage in this kind of mutual masturbation of each other's vaginas. And, you know, it's just a way of building and maintaining social bonds. No, and, are they? No. I mean, that's true. They're just well, and, really well, no, good here's friends. The no, here's the thing. Like, when we're talking about dolphins, or we're talking about macaques who do it too, or chimps who do it too, or bonobos also do this, we go, oh, they're building and maintaining social bonds. And when humans do it, we're like, you're a slut. Yeah. I, heard I am it. not a slut. I am building and maintaining social <laughs> bonds. I, I heard from over yeah. here, gal pals. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, what, from my experiences, uh, women who make other women orgasm, the, the social bonds are real strong. Uh, mm -hmm. Real strong. Uh, many of my friends still live with their ex's cats. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it just <laughs> never ends. <laughs> what do you got, Charlie? You want to come? You want to talk into the mic? Oh no! Uh, so, audience filth science hour. So, so this news article actually came out actually last year. Everyone knows the uh, famous black and white photo of the Loch Ness monster. The big, yeah, you know, yeah. the. Um, sci marine biologists, scientists have also noticed that when dolphins and other cetaceans uh, get horny and display, uh, their genitalia also makes that same shape. And Nessie's a dick pic. And, and people think that's actually an original black and white dick pic of a, uh, of a dolphin that somebody went, that looks really weird, that must be Nessie. <laughs> I mean, that, they, they wouldn't be the first. Many uh, people think that a lot of the sailors who think that they saw, like, you know, giant sea snakes were actually seeing. Because you have to understand, like, when we're talking about dolphin penises, They're these weird. are hung, okay? Yeah. Dolphins are substan- Oh, no, One twice time that. Twice I was that. standing in front of the beluga <laughs> tank, and a child came up to me and was like, look! The beluga's having a baby! <laughs> and the, the parent turned to me and was like smirking because I was gonna have to get out of this and I am a science communicator so I just explained oh. to that child oh. what was really happening. And I mean like belugas, dolphins, these are small potatoes, my friends. I'm sorry. Are they potatoes? Well, the barnacles are amazing. Yams. Barnacles yes. are great, but even <laughs> barnacle penises are up to 80 times the length of the barnacle. But because barnacles aren't very big. Longest penis-to-body ratio in the, the animal but kingdom. But I mean, even in the cetacean world, right? Like the other, um, you know, sperm whales, humpback whales, like these guys, we're looking at like six, seven, eight feet. Like they really get it going. And um, some of them uh, actually do it in, in like threesomes. There's actually a documented case of, I want to say it was a gray whale a uh, threesome where the female rolled over to the surface at just the right time for a bunch of scientists who happened to be in a boat for non-pornographic reasons. <laughs> Not for to sexual see. What does your hidden observer have to say about this experience? <laughs> this, this, your hidden garden observer, troll. this hidden observer observed one whale vagina and two whale penises coming in at opposite mm -hmm. directions. <laughs> the whale yeah. appeared to be having a great time. Yeah. <laughs> I love how many scientist jobs ultimately just, you can sum them up as, I like to watch insert species here fuck. Um, Personal science story. One time I got a phone call down in the lab and it was one of our animal care technicians and she goes, oh God, I need you to come upstairs. I think one of the mice is dying. And I'm like, oh no, what's wrong? She's like, he's really hurt. I'm like, oh no. And I go running up the stairs and she's like, 
as she hands me this box and I'm like, that, that is an erection. <laughs> she was new and she did not know what a mouse, the little a male death. mouse erection looks like. And I suppose it is a bit traumatic looking to those who are unfamiliar. It's rather pink and glistening. Um, yeah, she, she interrupted that poor mouse's day. So go- going back to Nessie for a moment, how do I make one of my nudes become a cryptid? That's my new life goal. Okay, got it. Sold. Instructions taken. I think, Watch I think, out for my only fan. I think Instagram has a lot of filters these days. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah but it's it's it, I I kind of used up all my really spicy ones earlier, but um we can go to boy bands now. Who's into boy bands? Mm, so our frogs. You are yeah, they are. My um, fire, so, so <laughs> my one desire. <laughs> when I say frogs I want it that way. way. Uh, so, <laughs> horn frogs have been recorded by scientists uh, again really voyeuristic scientists recording the horny noises of wood frogs um, and they determined that uh, wood frogs uh, t- t- form boy bands um, and that determines how well they have success in mating um, so in the laboratory, it seemed like the lady frogs were only into the deep voices. But then once they got out in the wild, they realized that no, lady frogs like a lot of different things, all right? There's something for everyone. Um, and so they'll, they'll form boy bands based on uh, sort of like they try to match resonance. So we're like all the low voice frogs would be like one band and you get all like the, the, the treble frogs or like another band. And they all go into their own little ponds <laughs> And the lady frogs decide which pond they want to check out based on the song that's the best. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, I'm a One Direction fan. I'm going over here. So, uh, like, is there always that one odd frog out that's, like, a member of the boy band, but nobody really understands why he's there? 100%. <laughs> uh, yeah, so once the lady frogs get to the pond of the boy band that they like, they then select individually. They go, oh, oh they, they that picking on them. Joey. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I'm into the Harry Styles frog and not into the, the I don't know the rest of them. I, <laughs> I met them I once. Think that, I think that's the moral of the story. <laughs> I don't uh, know the rest of them. I taught them how to touch an enemies at the Georgia Aquarium once, and I didn't know who they were at <laughs> all. And then PR was like, you did a great job. And I'm like, I don't know what's happening. And then I went back to our break room, and someone informed me that it was One Direction, and I have used this story to horrify teenage girls for many, many years. <laughs> So based on the list that I composed when we were originally chatting about topics, I've got baby saliva. Oh I've, yeah. I've got fatherless mice, and I've oh, got yeah. uh, uh, condom comfort scales. Eh, that one's good. That one's good. Oh, uh, okay. Condom comfort scales. That's this is another uh, scientists are bad at their jobs because they don't have any fun. Um, there has been a widely used com- condom comfort scale that was uh, basically, you know. Length, width, circumference, tightness. Um, and recently, some very uh, enterprising scientists in that field thought maybe we should change the scale to involve pleasure oh. and sensation oh. in rating wow. condom fit. <laughs> Let's slow down but, here. But why? I don't know. What's it for? <laughs> so when... Two people love each other very much. <laughs> but they don't want to be a mommy and a daddy. Or they met on Tinder. When the legislation is really or upsetting right now. Alter- about, or so alternately, if I have a beautiful orchid that I do not want <laughs> covered in semen, one might want a prophylactic. Or alternately, when two humans come together on the smoking Well, deck, not necessarily. I mean, optimistically. <laughs> Ideally. They rarely come together, I, I found. That's a myth. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's all there is to that, is that somebody realized that maybe that should be part of oh, the good. rating factor. It's good to have scientific development. Glad someone, glad someone spoke up. <laughs> But yeah, I have baby spit. Yeah, please talk yeah. about spit. Oh yeah, yeah so um, I don't know why I put this in After Dark except for the fact that I hate spit. But anyway, <laughs> um, so did you know, like, babies can determine, like, 
who is, is closer to whom by whether or not they've seen them share spit. And they can do this well. starting at the age of eight months. I am not kidding. So the scientists basically, <laughs> they used a puppet because everything's better with puppets. <laughs> okay, and they basically had a human. No, 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 you gotta use my puppet. So they have a human and a puppet and the human licked his finger and then put the finger in the mouth of the puppet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then they and had the puppet another has herpes. human who just tapped her forehead and then tapped the puppet's forehead. And they had a baby watch this video, this riveting <laughs> TV. Uh, and then they had the puppet cry. <laughs> and then they looked to the kid to see if the baby, who the baby would look to first to help the crying puppet. And the answer is eight to nine, 10 month old babies look to the person who shared the spit to help the crying puppet before they look to other people. Yes. And this works not just for spit, it also works for sharing food. So if they see a person share an orange slice with the puppet, um, whereas the other person shares a ball, they will look to the person who shared the food. And the, the net thing is that, yeah, babies know that spit sharing is caring. Uh, what I'm hearing is that Science Track needs to do an entry in the Puppet Slam mm-hmm. next year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I do have some puppets. Let's do it. So yeah, I mean, fatherless mice. Fatherless mice. Uh, Parthenogenesis is not just the name of my 80s cover band. It is also a really cool scientific phenomenon in which I'm glad one person liked my joke. You're my favorite. Um, uh, all the gold stars. Uh, yeah, so no, they... It, it, parthenogenesis is where you have a species that reproduces without a male involved. Um, and this is actually not unheard of in, in uh, you know, uh, snakes and sharks and sort of the squishy creatures. Uh, and Jurassic Park as well. It's a plot line. Um, that's and lizards. True. And lizards, yes. Again, all the squishy creatures. Uh, uh, but we've never seen it in a mammal before, until now. Um, yeah, so uh, scientists were able to uh, make a baby mouse happen without any man mice, uh, which is actually incredibly cool and like a major yeah. step forward because that has some major implications for like potential fertility treatments going forward. And, and like also has something to do with the potential de-evolution and disappearance of the Y chromosome, which you can hear more about tomorrow Ooh. on the Sex is the Minority panel. I look uh, no, I'm sorry, not tomorrow. Sunday. Sunday at 8.30. I look forward to being obsolete. <laughs> yeah, no, Sunday. Sunday at 8.30, the Sex is the Minority panel where I can talk to you all about the potential demise of why. Uh, I think my last good one, uh, who wants to hear about cock swapping? Yeah! Yeah. Uh, So, uh, we have relatively recently successfully done the first full penis and scrotum transplant. Uh, Turns out that's real hard. Ah. I am sorry. Um, (laughs) But typically people who have lost uh, penises due to accidents or surgery uh, have a phalloplasty where the doctors take some other chunk of their body and shape it into sort of a penisy tube and stitch that on. And that works reasonably well, but it doesn't, it, it like for like uh, evacuating urine, but is otherwise pretty useless for other functions. Um, this particular candidate had no viable sites for phalloplasty but there was a viable donor of a penis and scrotum. And so they developed a specific surgery just for this candidate and managed to do the transplant. And not only was it successful, a year later, they have uh, basically full sensation, erectile function, uh, orgasm function, not a... uh, um, And for some reason, very, they, they highlighted Ken P standing up. Um, that's a big deal. No, that, no that's, it, it, but that's, 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 that's very, very important. exciting. Yeah. And all, all my all my trans friends joke about being able to just Venmo each other uh, the genitals that they don't want, and <laughs> I'm really I'm gonna I'm bringing this back. <laughs> Uh, my I, question is, how do you look at your potential donors and go, mm, no, uh, no, no, <laughs> ah, yep, yep, that one. Swipe right. Thank Tender. you. Steve. Yeah, yeah. Swipe left. Swipe Donor. right. <laughs> Sorry. Apparently, I have questions <laughs> at the back. Yeah, at the back. I noticed you said penis and scrotum, so the testicles weren't involved. 
Uh, no. Um, that is a whole nother ball game. Ah! We're strong really with wish- the puns I, tonight. I, I really uh, wish that was intentional. Sorry. More importantly, <laughs> that gets into the ethical implications of whose children would you be having? Ooh. Repeat the question yeah. is what Steven said. Oh, oh right. Sorry. Um, what about the, what about the testicles? Um, so they were not transplanted at... I don't know why, but there, uh, I think it, yeah, it is a uh, matter of that. Thing. And there's also probably much more complications with uh, rejection and acceptance of that organ. It's a completely mm. different organ. Mm. Um, and they're going to do a testic- uh, testicle prosthesis soon. So at the moment, the scrotum does not have testicles in it, which is not that uncommon for like lost testicles. Mm-hmm. You just don't have them. Uh, but they often add new testicles in uh, for the... Aesthetic. Aesthetics, yeah. comfort, shape, feeling like you're in your own body kind of thing. Uh, For dogs, they call them nudicles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Is there another follow-up to that? Was the donor dead? Uh, I believe was the donor dead? so. The yeah, it's, it's um, an interesting, relevant question. Though. Yeah, I believe it was like standard organ donor. Rather. Like, yeah, there's other possible conditions, but I believe it was standard organ donor conditions yeah. that the organ donor was deceased. I'm, I'm waiting for the day that I get my Velcro penis. Um, <laughs> so in yeah. the back, we got another follow-up. There's, this, is, this is way more than I expected. <laughs> really? Uh, the new sensation, was it nerve regeneration? No, it was, uh, well, it, it was successful nerve connection. So doctors have gotten pretty good at connecting yeah. nerves. Um, and the nerves in the penis are pretty big. Um, so some of it is, is, is regrowth and, and reconnections, but most of it is the surgical connection sort of healing successfully. There's actually a lot of cocktails that have been developed. Ah. Cocktails. Ah. That, was, that was actually completely unintentional. No, because the <laughs> cocktails have been developed for spinal regeneration. Um, studies of spinal regeneration and like nerve reconnection, and they have not worked for spines but they can help. You can actually use some of those growth factors to help with um, nerve regeneration in places like the penis. Yeah, I unfortunately don't have all of the details because this was a, a case report rather than like a, an exhaustive study. Yeah. Uh, I think Steven's trying to get us to wrap yeah, this up. Sure is, is that what that sign is? He wants so, us to go away. So you all got 50% extra on this panel. Yeah. So I expect 50% extra <laughs> yeah. reviews yeah, sorry, sorry. on the app. Rate and review and, and buy B's book. And I'll yes. see all of you at Sulfur X, right? Tomorrow at 10. Okay. Thank you so much for coming out for the science track. Have a lovely rest of your con. Yeah.